I guess my next question would be, can you tell us what's happening on the brain when we're becoming to, addicted to a substance? Oh, so much. Like so much is happening in the brain. So here's, here's the challenge with addiction. It, it's, um, it's not just neurological slash physiological. It's not just psychological, right? It's not just emotional. It's not just spiritual, right? It's all of that, right? Addiction is so difficult to treat and so difficult to heal from because we have to have an approach that touches the emotional, the spiritual, the physical, uh, the, the neurochemical, like it, all that has to be into play, right? Um, and, and so from a, from a brain standpoint or a neurological standpoint, what's going on is our brains are made to say yes to anything that br brings us a sense of security or belonging or mattering. So anything that moves us from distress to security, specifically around issues of humiliation or terror, okay? So shame or fear, right? Our brain is made to say yes, 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 yes to. It doesn't care what that thing is. Right? If it's a great relationship, yes, right? If it's spiritual enlightenment, yes, yes. If it's a joint, yes. Like if it moves us from terror or humiliation to a sense of security, our limbic brain says yes, okay? Um, so we as humans, we're the only creatures that have the ability to think about what we're thinking about. We have consciousness, right? So we have psychology. So beyond just being biological creatures, uh, addiction is also psychological in that we make meaning out of our lives. We have to make meaning. And so with every addict, there's a story of this addiction trying to make my life meaningful, right? And that's got to be dealt with. Along with the fact you can, we found this really early in the 60s with methadone clinics and uh, in heroin treatment. You can give people medicine that cures the physical addiction of treatment. And they're done being a physical addict, right? Their body stops craving the disease. The minute they get out of treatment, they'll leave methadone and go do heroin. Like that was over and over again proven. So we gave up methadone clinics because it didn't work, right? Because we weren't addressing the psychological. And then we also weren't addressing the emotional, right? And we weren't addressing the spiritual. So all of those components have to be part of it. Uh, but the brain piece is a huge part of it because we are mammals that have brains, yeah. you know? Um, and the number one addiction in America is sugar. It's the huh. number one addiction. And if you go into your grocery stores, you'll, you'll see a ring of healthy foods, whole foods, around the center of sugar. From alcohol all the way down to the baking aisle, it's a different form of sugar, right? And so we're being fed addiction from a, from a and I love sugar. It's not a, not a bad thing. Alcohol's not a bad thing. You know, um, morphine, got a, an infection a couple of years ago, I was in the hospital, Morphine was a wonderful thing. It was so wonderful. It's great. I loved it. I wish I could do it every day. I just can't, right? Um, yes, exactly. You know, so those are all good things. Uh, like sex addiction is a great thing. Sex is a great thing. It's, it's so great. It, it works as an addiction, right? Per, uh, performance, uh, affirmation, acceptance, acknowledgement is a great thing or performance turns into addiction, right? So our brain will say yes. And so part of recovery is abstinence from the thing that was harming us, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so we can begin to stop the, the process of, of the brain in order to give ourselves time to make new pathways, new, new memories, new behaviors, new patterns, which takes some time, right? Yeah. So, so anything we can do to help arrest that those neurological patterns in the brain um, is good, right? So abstinence is one, you know, there are some uh, pharma pharmacological support that helps people, right? That alone won't cure it. You can't cure addiction that way, right? But you could stop those processes in the brain because what we have found with brain research is that the more something relieves us from terror or humiliation, those two specifically, right? Shame and fear, trauma, Right. But um, the more I've moved from the more significant those experiences to the more relief, the uh, 
the connections in the brain are stronger around those things than anything else, right? And the sheathing around those neurons is tougher than anything else. So those memories are always there. That's why in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, that talk about always being an addict is important. What, what they didn't know, what uh, you know, Dr. Bob and Bill didn't know when they invented it, is they were talking about neurochemistry, that those things don't ever go away, right? Now, you're, I, I think your identity as an addict can shift to being a person recovering from addiction to a person recovering to live fully, right? So your identity becomes that more than the addiction. Um, but those pathways in the brain will always be there and they always uh, will be available to us, especially in times of stress and anxiety, loneliness or shame, those things come up. Um, and so we need practices and habits and routines and principles and community and support around all that other stuff, you know, too. Does that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense. And I'm so glad you're talking about this because I know when I first reached out to you and told you, you know, I use medication to help myself overcome alcohol addiction, you were like, yeah, like that's not something we fully support because that alone won't do it. And I totally, I kind of learned that the hard way because I was not wanting to drink, but I was like, oh, I'm feeling all these emotions. What's going on? But I see that so often with people where perhaps they're not realizing how complicated their relationship to alcohol or substance is. So they are like, oh yeah, medication can help. Um, but then they find that they don't want to drink, but they keep drinking anyway, because it's this coping yeah. mechanism. So would you yeah. mind? It's also deeply rooted in the limbic brain and in the brain stem and in the physiology. Oh, sorry. I just made you disappear. There Bring you go. Back. Okay, there we go. It's so deeply rooted in every facet of the human body that your your thinking brain, your your prefrontal lobe, your frontal your frontal cortex, your temporal lobes, you can't think your way out of addiction. It's not a thinking problem, right? It's not a morality problem. Like it is at the deepest places, it's physiological, it's psychological, it's emotional and spiritual. Like it's part of us that's not thinking. The best parts of human beings are not the thinking parts, right? Yeah. Um, we talk about in this book and in other books that the best humans get is four years old. That's the best we get, right? <laughs> like we're pure, we're honest, we're brave, we, we feel our feelings, we get over them quickly. Like, you know? That is so and funny. Then, right? And then we start getting skills. We go to school and get skills. And then we get more skills and we think our identities are our skills. And then those of us in recovery, have to realize it's about getting back to being a four-year-old on a daily basis. It's actually what keeps us well, you know? And um, yeah, I love what you said about like you stopped drinking. That was in some aspects, the easier part, like to not want to drink because you could take a drug that makes you feel sick when you drink. Right. And, and make another drug that stops the cravings, but then you had feelings yeah. and we think feelings are going to kill us. Yeah. So a lot of, addiction recovery is learning to tolerate feelings you know and actually we start to look at them as being gifts and we start to see the benefit of feelings yeah um but no one's ever died from feelings ever <laughs> no one's ever died from feelings well, right? but like they feel like they're gonna kill us and for me like i felt like it was like i'm naturally equipped like that's how i was made to be able to feel these and cope with them but i was just out of practice so it was kind of like building that yeah. muscle um, yes. And like yeah. the part in the book that talks about like the woman who, you know, was back in childhood and those needs we have in childhood, like that made me realize, oh yeah, this, this started way earlier than I thought. Oh, I had a, a, a moment on Friday this week. I was hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, and I did not stop, right? Uh, so I have this tool called HALT, right? And I did not stop. Um, and I got a call from a colleague about something inconsequential that I had enough sense that I did not need to respond, but I was, I was exploding on the inside. Right. But I have this new tool called like friends. And so I reached out to one friend and I raged and he says, sounds like that's not about work. It sounds like it's about something else. I wonder what that's about. And I was like, I don't know. You're an asshole. And like, then I went to my next friend and I got the same feedback. And I went to Heather and I got similar feedback and then I got good orderly direction, right? I listened to God mm -hmm. and good orderly direction said, you probably need to wait till Monday to address that. And after resting this weekend and playing some, I was so able to talk to my work colleague this morning and say, 
hey, I'm sorry I was cranky on Friday. Let's talk about that thing today. And she was like, no problem. But if I would have talked about it on Friday, oh my gosh, right? Um, I was a toddler. I was, I was feeling like a toddler. Yeah. Which reminds me, it was probably something connected to me being a toddler. Yeah. You know, that if I could learn to trust those feelings and whenever my feelings are bigger than the actual event, it's about my story. Every time, every time, every time, you yeah. know? And get, getting that skill of like learning to feel my feelings, to tell the truth about them and give them over to the, the process and God and, the pro and God owns the process. Mm -hmm. Like that is the pathway to peace, you know? Um, that's why Chip's book, Voice of the Heart, is such a good book about mm -hmm. these eight feelings. There's only eight feelings. They all have gifts. They're not the problem. It's what we do to get away from the feelings are the problem, you know? And it's called Voice the, of the Heart? Yeah, Voice of the Heart by Chip Dodd. Okay. Great book. Uh, eight core emotions, you know? So they're all good. We can look at them. They go, why are seven bad? They're not bad. Life's tragic. So we need seven words to describe how hard life is. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and they're all gifts. Like one of them is sadness. You know, sadness is the feeling that helps me value things, right? Yeah. Um, and when I learn to feel my sadness and tolerate my sadness, it helps me know what's important to me. It also lets me come to this place called an acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. And if I don't get skilled at feeling sadness and trusting my sadness, I'll have to practice self-pity, which is getting other people to feel sorry for me because I don't want to feel sad, right? right? And addicts are great at self-pity. And we yeah. use it as a reason to act out, right? Or drink or mood alter. That's our reason is well, I'm all alone. No one understands me. No one's got as hard as me. We become special and unique. We forget how ordinary we are, you know, and self-pity you know, addicts hate sadness. Yeah. Um, you know, we love shame. We love shame. It's a good motivator, but yeah. it doesn't really do anything much. So would you say that's like the hardest part for people when they're going through recovery is to start feeling those emotions again? Yeah. Yeah. Because feel, with feelings come stories mm. and memories and things we've tried to stay away from. And we have to then do the psychological, emotional, and spiritual work of facing, naming those things, right? Mm. That we can't behave our way out of psychology. Uh, okay, we can't behave our way out of spirituality. Like there, we are, as humans, we are not the center of the universe. Like whether you have a God or don't have a God, um, you're not the center of the universe. There's something bigger than you, yeah. you know, around, right? And for those of us who have God, it's God. And we have to come to terms with God doesn't behave the way I want God to behave, yeah. which is powerlessness, you know? Um, my powerlessness over God is a big deal, right? Uh, and then those of us who don't have God, we have death. Yeah. Yeah. Like, death wins, you know? Um, and so we're all powerless to, to life. Right. Yeah. And which makes us the, the gift is we are not the center of the universe. We're part of the story. We're part of the universe, but it doesn't revolve around us. And there's so much freedom in that. But with that freedom comes feelings. Right. Because yeah. um, we all have stories where either we felt like we weren't protected or we felt betrayed or we felt abandoned or we were abandoned, betrayed, neglected, abused, you know, um, and those wounds become great motivation in our lives to do extraordinary things. They also become great fuel to self-protect and self-medicate. And, and the paradox of addiction is addiction makes us the center of, the, of our own world. Instead of part of the world, everything becomes about us all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's we're a black hole of everything we tried not to have. It ends up being about that pain and self-pity and, loneliness and all the things we're trying to get away from, it just becomes become a magnet for those things in addiction. Yeah.